webcast from STEAM Universe, the new sister publication to THE Journal and Campus Technology. My name is David Nagel, Editor-in-Chief and Editorial Director of the Education Group here at 1105 Media. We're kicking off this series of webcasts with just a great couple of speakers tack tackling a subject that is near and dear to all of our hearts, funding, specifically funding STEM and getting creative with federal education dollars. The event is brought to you today by STEAM Universe and made possible by our sponsors Acer and Connection. Our featured speakers today are Anand Vaishnav and Jacob Waters. I think we really couldn't have picked two better speakers to lead off this series. Anand is principal at Education First, where he's been since 2009. He was previously chief of staff for Boston Public Schools. And before that, he was a reporter for two daily newspapers. His work at Education First includes, among other things, college and career ready standards implementation, alignment of K-12 and higher education systems, strategic planning, and organizational startups. Jacob is manager of thought leadership at Education First, where he handles external communication and dissemination of Education First work and provides communications and public affairs support. Jacob joined Education First earlier this year and was previously manager of public affairs for the nonprofit Philadelphia School Partnership, whose focus is to expand access to quality schools for low-income students in Philadelphia. Thank you all again for joining us today. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. First, if you would like to enlarge the slides, look at the square icon at the top right corner of the slide window. You can also view the presentation in full screen mode by clicking the squared arrows icon. If you would like to submit a question at any time, just look for the question field to the left of the slide window. Type in your question there and hit submit. We'll field the questions at the end of the presentation. If you have any technical difficulties during the session, look for the yellow question mark icon below the slide window. Click there for technical assistance. If you would like to download a copy of today's presentations, just look for the resource center below, uh, just below the question field. Finally, within the next day or two, we will email you a link to the archived version of this session so you can view it again or share it with a colleague. The on-demand version of this webcast will be available for 90 days after today. And now, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Anand Vaishnav and Jacob Waters. Great. Thank you, David. And uh, good afternoon or morning, depending on your time zone. Um, I just wanted to begin by thanking David, Mallory, Olivia, and uh, their colleagues at CM Universe for hosting Jacob and me on uh, this uh, presentation to you. We're really excited to share uh, the findings from a recent report that we did called Making the Most of ESSA, Opportunities to Advance STEM Education, uh, and it was a review of ESSA plans for innovations in STEM. Uh, and so Jacob and I are going to split up the presentation and we'll take you through our methodology and our findings. Uh, and so we very much look forward to answering your questions as well at the end. So just uh, a little bit about uh, who we are. Education First is a national education policy consulting firm. Uh, and we primarily work with states and uh, state departments of education, school districts, foundations, nonprofits on all uh, matter of issues regarding K-12 education and some higher ed as well. We've been for the past year or so deeply involved in uh, working with states on their uh, ESSA plans, writing them, editing them, developing policies for them. Uh, and we've also been uh, involved in analyzing the content of ESSA plans for various foundations and nonprofits that are involved in education. We created this resource on behalf of the Overdeck Family Foundation in New York. And it was really just to answer the basic question of what are states proposing on STEM in their ESSA plans? And how can advocates, funders, educators um, push those ideas even further? And uh, so what we're going to be doing is sharing a little bit of background uh, with you. For uh, those of you who are less familiar with ESSA, we'll talk a little bit uh, about that. But first, um, just to uh, ground us in kind of the main issue of the day, STEM, I think everybody on this line will, will probably agree that high-quality STEM education is vital, not just for our country uh, in terms of the economy of, uh, of the nation and and individual states, but also for students' well-rounded education. There's a lot of research 
showing that uh, STEM skills are important not just for boosting science and math knowledge, but also for characteristics such as creativity and uh, teamwork. And we know that STEM helps to foster those. Uh, the downside uh, certainly is that uh, inequitable access to STEM jeopardizes uh, both of those goals of fostering knowledge in science and math as well as a well-rounded education. Generally, students of color and in high poverty schools are, do not have the same kind of access and employment opportunities as their peers. And this is where ESSA comes in. Uh, it's the Every Student Succeeds Act, which is the nation's main federal education law, a successor to uh, No Child Left Behind, which was passed in the George W. Bush administration. And because of ESSA's relatively more uh, autonomy for states, uh, it gives states a little bit more leeway to expand STEM in ways that uh, No Child Left Behind didn't. And so how does it do that? Mainly it's in three funding categories, uh, Title I for accountability and school improvement, Title II for teacher training and support, and uh, Title IV, which is a grant, or sorry, a, a, a title in ESSA that has a very large uh, grant for uh, academic enrichment, as well as the biggest pot of funding for after-school programs. There's also, I'll say before handing over to Jacob, there's also um, one area of ESSA called Title III, which is primarily geared toward English language learners, which has some flexibility in, uh, in there to spend uh, resources uh, for English language learners on STEM, but uh, these uh, titles here, one, two, and four, are the main sources of funding for STEM in ESSA. Jacob? Sure, thank you, Anand. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit now about the, the methodology for our report. So initially, uh, to frame and inform our research, the first thing we did was consult experts. So we spoke to them about what they had already seen about STEM and ESSA, uh, the types of policies we should look for, and also which of the, the draft plans that we should read. Uh, if, if you're not aware, there are two deadlines for states to submit uh, ESSA plans, one in April and one uh, actually just last week. And so we ended up reading all of the plans, all 17 that had been submitted uh, in April and then uh, eight additional draft plans that had been um, been recommended to us by experts, and uh, you know, that's uh, a suffice to say that would not recommend that as a, as a beach reading. Um, so when when we actually started reading the plans, we we found that you know while there was some innovation, we were actually more struck by the handful of policies that kind of trended throughout the plans. Um, there were a number of policies that we saw um, over and over again. And so that really got us thinking about what opportunity there was there. You know, we asked ourselves, how can states really get those policies right? Um, if they're implemented in the right way, um, how can they expand uh, access to, to high quality STEM education while pushing equity? And that equity piece was, uh, was a priority for us. We, um, you know, it, it's not enough to just expand ac access. We wanna make sure that uh, traditionally underserved populations could have access to those. Um, same opportunities. So we ended up with four policies that we kind of focused on uh, and uh, and also sampled a few other uh, examples of innovation throughout. Then after identifying those policies, we spoke with a number of experts about what they thought would be the best ways to, um, to implement them in a way that promoted STEM education and equity um, and featured their recommendations. And then we also found some concrete examples of these policies in action on the ground at the state level. Uh, and also some organizations that support them. So again, just some background on, on the timeline with ESSA. So um, again, all, all 50 states in the District of Columbia uh, were required to submit ESSA plans. Uh, again, 17 submitted in April and the rest um, submitted on Monday. There were actually, a, a, or last Monday, I'm sorry, and a few states were actually given an extension um, due, to, uh, due to the impact of the hurricane. And so here's, a, here's our map of states that we ended up reviewing. As you can see 17 states uh, that submitted plans and eight draft plans. And again, we think we got a pretty good sense of, of the country uh, in terms of, of STEM policies. You can see a pretty wide geography there. Um, and I uh, think we have a pretty, uh, pretty representative uh, sample there. So I'm gonna pass it back to Anna now to talk about some of our findings. 
Thanks, Jacob. And one uh, quick caveat is, uh, as Jacob mentioned, we uh, produced this report in July when um, most of the states that had submitted plans at the time, about uh, 17 of them, those plans had not yet at, that, at the time been approved by the federal government. Um, the U.S. Department of Education typically reviews the plan, sends uh, some feedback uh, back to the states, asks for changes, and then signs off. At this point, most of those original 17 plans have now been approved. Um, so the data that we have um, largely has not changed. Uh, they've, they, it stayed consistent. Um, and then some of the states that we reviewed that were in draft form have now submitted their official plans uh, to the department, as Jacob mentioned last Monday, with a few exceptions. Uh, and so we hope to dive into those, those uh, plans, um, you know, this fall and winter as we see, uh, you know, whether they have followed through with their, with their plans on STEM. So as Jacob mentioned, um, there were kind of four uh, policies that trended throughout the plans that, we, that, we, that cut across many of the, uh, of the state's proposals. Um, and that's what was most interesting to us, is there seemed to be a coalescing around these four main things. And we're going to take each of these uh, a little bit more in depth. I do want to say that it's, it's worth noting that ESSA plans don't necessarily include all of a state's initiatives. And that's a really important caveat because um, these plans are basically applications to the federal government for federal funding. And so there are, you know, there's an application, and it, it calls for certain things. Uh, but in some cases, a state might have a very robust, say, STEM advisory council uh, that might not be mentioned in the ESSA plan, or uh, its State Department of Education might be doing something with its higher education institutions on STEM that maybe wouldn't fall in any of the federal funding categories, and so therefore, you know, is not mentioned or, or not prominent. So that's just uh, we want to state that up front that uh, the ESSA plan doesn't include everything about a state's STEM agenda. Uh, but we'll include at least a lot of it when it comes to K-12. So let's take a look at the first one. Um, so th this one had to do with uh, the inclusion of performance on state science tests in accountability systems. Uh, and so as uh, you, you may know, under No Child Left Behind, um, and this actually uh, continued under ESSA, uh, English and math were the two subjects that had to, absolutely had to be tested uh, in grades three through eight and then once in high school. What ESSA did, though, was allow flexibility for states to put in other indicators. Um, so, for example, science or social studies or um, things like chronic absenteeism. And so we wanted to see, you know, with that flexibility, how many states uh, were proposing to include science, performance on science tests in their accountability systems, which is the way that states will, uh, you know, determine which schools are low performing and which schools need the most support and which schools are uh, exemplars. Um, and so the way uh, this, uh, the slide is structured, and this goes for all of our finding slides, is on the left you'll see a map that shows which states include science in their accountability system or a timeline for doing so in the future. In this case, uh, the, that's a state that's shaded in orange. Whereas the green states are states whose plans we read that don't, at least at the time we read them, did not include science in accountability systems. Um, and then, so then to the right, you'll see kind of our thinking, which is if states do include this, how can they promote success with it? So in other words, what are some of the things that they could do either using the results of science and accountability systems or that they should be thinking about um, the, the implications of including science and accountability? So one example is uh, instructional time. Generally, when subjects are put in accountability systems and states are rated on them, or excuse me, schools and districts are rated on them, that leads to lots of decisions on how to put resources toward them. Uh, and one of that, uh, one big resource is one of time. Um, and so uh, we have found that when states include science and accountability systems, what happens? Schools uh, and districts spend to tend, uh, tend to spend more time on science, uh, especially at the elementary level. And so you'll see that the rest of the slides mirror this. Every time you know, we, we had a finding, we wanted to dig into it a little deeper and think, well, what could what could states do with, uh, uh, you know, including science and accountability systems, and how could they use the data? So the next slide is sort of what we pulled out from that. So uh, 
what we tried to do is for every uh, idea that we had in terms of how states can spend resources uh, toward uh, the indicator, in this case, science and accountability systems, uh, we wanted to come up with some best practices or some cases of where states have uh, successfully, successfully done this. Uh, so here is an example. Um, you know, I gave uh, the earlier uh, example of um, spending time on science uh, and that states that do this are not only likely to spend more time on it, but are also likely to have more hands-on activities um, related to science. Um, another thing that including science and accountability systems can do is really shed a light on uh, where uh, resources might be distributed. Um, so we think that this allows states and districts to look at the results and prompt them to dig deeper. How are schools resources, resourced to support science? Is that equitable across the district? Um, so we, we sort of pose these questions with uh, kind of promising practices and examples um, across the, uh, the various findings that we had. So I'll turn it uh, now to Jacob to, uh, to talk about our next finding. Hey. Uh, thank you, Anand. So the next policy we focused on is uh, career and technical education. Um, and as, as Anand mentioned, as, as part of ESSA, states are required to create a system for holding their schools accountable. And what we found was 17 states included career and technical education in, in one of their indicators for how they're holding themselves accountable. And this varied slightly in how, um, how it was implemented. So in some cases, if student, students having access to career and technical education would be completing coursework or something like acquiring uh, an official industry credential. So it, before I, I get into this, it's important to note that, you know, there's this misconception around career and technical education that it's you know, the, this idea of quote-unquote VOTEC, where this is really a, a programming that exists for students who can't cut it on the college track. And that's um, increasingly not the case. Actually, many students uh, who focus in career and technical education do attend college, and, um, and that's, in fact, many, uh, the, the focus of, of some of the programming. So how can states have or include uh, career and technical education in a way that uh, – that supports STEM. So first, uh, we can talk about uh, linking this coursework to career-ready standards, so sort of raising the bar there, um, providing career counseling, uh, coordinating this better with, um, with local industry in the pipeline, um, you make sure you're using multiple measures, and then really thinking strategically about how to give students access to, this, um, to career opportunities. So first of all, starting with this uh, career and uh, college and career ready standards piece. So what this is really about is ensuring that there's enough rigor in, in coursework so that students are actually prepared um, with the skills they need to be successful in this career. So this means not just sort of the basic skills required in the job, but also looking at things like critical thinking and problem solving and teamwork. Additionally, it's, uh, it's important to recognize that one that you really should be multi uh, measuring whether a student is prepared for college and career in, in multiple ways, that there's no, um, there's no one single metric for that um, that can sort of paint that whole picture. Um, and additionally, that uh, schools and districts should be looking at uh, subsets of the data and to disaggregate it in a way so that, you know, for instance, if African-American students aren't doing well um, uh, in, in, in that programming, that changes are necessary. And then additionally, again, make this providing career counseling, making sure that students, um, once they have the skills, kind of know what, what they need to do in order to turn that into a career. Um, the, the, these final two practices here are related to um, really coordinating with local industry. And, you know, this seems like, you know, a fairly common sense practice, but it um, unfortunately doesn't happen as much as, as you might think. So what, what this really is about is making sure that, um, that, that once a student has an opportunity to take a, a CTE course and go through a CTE pathway, that they have real opportunities in, in the workplace. Um, and so, for instance, in, in Tennessee, they actually look at what the kind of high-wage growth occupations are in the state and make sure, that, um, make sure that their CTE programming is aligned with that and actually regularly connecting with industry leaders to make sure um, students are, are, are prepared. And um, 
and in order when, when that happens, it really sets up students for um, for success in their career and and makes sure that um, that CTE meets its goal of of giving uh, all students those those opportunities they need. I'm going to pass it over to Anand to talk about uh, talk about the next one. Great, thanks, Jacob. So uh, our third finding is about the use of advanced placement and international baccalaureate uh, uh, scores in accountability systems. So I think most people on the call probably know uh, what those are, AP and IB. Uh, they're generally uh, coursework as well as uh, exams and, the, and at the end of the courses that uh, if students uh, pass are able to get college credit on. Um, it's Big, it's a big deal, you know, in in, uh, in many states. Uh, it allows, uh, has allowed thousands and thousands, if not millions, of students to uh, be exposed to college level coursework uh, while still in high school, and then if they do well on the subsequent exam, to get college credit for it. Um, so it saves money as well. Uh, and what we found was that 19 of the 25 states that we reviewed included or are strongly considering including uh, AP and IB indicators in their accountability systems. Now, they're doing that in a number of different ways. So in some cases, the states are saying, uh, we're going we're gonna to measure access. So in other words, if, uh, you know, if your school or district does not have adequate access, uh, and they will have to define what adequate is, uh, then uh, you know that will that will uh, count in the accountability system. Other states are saying you know we're we're not going to look at access, but we're going to look at uh, test performance. So you might have lots of access uh, to advanced placement tests uh, for your students, but if they don't do well on the exams, then uh, it uh, you know it's less of a benefit. So we're going to measure uh, exam performance on AP or IB. Um, and so, as you can see there, uh, you know, we, we, there's a lot of literature actually about um, the use of advanced placement uh, in particular. And one thing I think that we came across is that one important uh, uh, notion to think about um, is that this indicator is generally used for high schools, right, because that's where these tests are given and the courses are taken. Um, but if you start at, at looking at AP and IB at a high school at the high school level, uh, it's actually too late um, because uh, many students who who uh, get to that to the high school level might not be prepared for the rigor of AP and IB courses. And so, one of the best practices we found is uh, it's important to think of a pipeline for AP and eventual AP and IB courses. So that is a pipeline in two ways. One is um, encouraging students uh, to take uh, more challenging coursework and prepare them for more challenging coursework in middle schools. Um, but then there's also a really huge part about uh, teacher development. Um, not everybody can teach uh, an AP or IB class. And so making sure that you have a pipeline of teachers who know how to do that and can do that is equally important. So we're in, in, in covering this uh, particular issue, we're suggesting that if states are going to include AP and IB indicators in their accountability systems at the high school level, which is kind of where that usually lives, um, don't wait until the high school uh, level to start making policy changes uh, around AP uh, and IB preparation. Um, I'll turn it now to Jacob to talk about our, uh, our final finding. Great, thank you, Anand. So the, the final policy here that we're gonna highlight is um, the encouragement or requirement of STEM activities in uh, what are called 21st Century Community Learning Center grants. So what these are basically, is you, you can just think of them as, as after school programs. So the way this works is that as part of as part of Title IV and ESSA, um, states are able to give competitive grants to um, to fund these after school programs. And we found that ten states, um, in various ways, were prioritizing STEM in their um, in this application process. So that um, if, if you make a proposal that includes STEM, that you will somehow you're somehow more likely to um, to receive um, receive that funding. And um, and so the, the reason this is important is because a lot of research has shown that kind of this quote unquote informal STEM education um, can be particularly important, that a lot of the passion that, um, that students can develop for STEM actually does not necessarily come from the classroom, but from things like going to museums and, and seeing experiments outside of school. And so 
we found that there are a number of ways that uh, states can leverage these 21st century community learning center grants to, um, to promote STEM and equity. So first of all, it's important for states to make sure that what students are learning in the 21st century community learning centers uh, is, is really supplementary to the K-12 standards. You want to make sure that, um, that what they're doing out after school, while not redundant to what they're learning in school, is, is related so they can um, uh, develop a kind of deeper learning there. Uh, another huge piece is making sure you're engaging parents. There's a ton of interest among parents in general um, about or, or, or desire for parent, uh, parents to send their children to after-school programs that um, that include STEM, and so making sure that parents are aware of the opportunities and that um, you're really trying to reach all parents when recruiting for these programs. Additionally, it's as I mentioned, there's a it, it's important to make sure that you're giving students uh, kind of exciting experiences that can drive uh, long-term passion and, and interest in STEM. So that's things like going to museums and, and seeing uh, and, and experiences and experiments. So, for instance, as I mentioned here, NASA has created programming for 21st century community learning centers. And potentially that could you know, make a, or create a budding astronaut in, uh, in, in the courses. And again, it's, uh, it's important to recognize here that or it's important to focus on, on equity throughout this, right? That there's low-income students are a lot less likely to have these opportunities um, in, in their lives. And so making sure that through these 21st century community learning centers, you're um, giving these opportunities to, to students who need the most. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about some, a, a few other, uh, or some more details about this. So first of all, as I mentioned, states, talked about STEM and their 21st century community learning center plans in various ways and with basically varying degrees of strength. Um, so, for instance, Connecticut, you can see that they sort of placed fostering digital learning as one of the goals of, of the 21st century community learning centers, which is a relatively weak way to put it, and contrast that with New Mexico, where actually they're requiring all 21st century community learning center um, applicants to have some sort of STEM focus. So it's important to keep that in mind. Um, the other thing we wanted to touch on briefly were uh, Title II and Title IV, which are um, two of the other parts of, of ESSA where there could be opportunities for, um, for STEM. And before I just go into this, it's, it's important to remember that you know, currently in the, in the budget discussions in Congress, um, the, the Trump administration basically propose uh, you know, basically slashing all of the funding for Title II and Title IV, um, which would you know, render all this moot. Um, however, Congress, but both houses of Congress have been putting that back in. So it's, it's a little unclear how that's all going to shake out in, in negotiations, but it's important to, um, to note that there. Um, so first of all, very quickly, Title II. So Title II is about primarily uh, an, an educator effectiveness. So um, training teachers and giving them uh, the skills they need to, to be effective in the classroom. And there's certainly opportunity for STEM there. Um, as you can see here, there's a number of examples of states who uh, prioritize STEM in some way in there. And then similarly, um, in, uh, in, in Title IV, states can, um, you know, the, the Title IV is about sort of general student support and uh, Title IV Part A and provide those additional supports, increase access to courses, improve school conditions, that sort of thing. And so a number of other states uh, prioritize STEM in some way in, uh, in, in that section. And I'm going to pass it uh, back to Anand to um, wrap up this presentation. Great. Thanks, Jacob. Um, so uh, just to uh, recap, um, uh, we found sort of four big uh, uh, high-impact policies that turned it across, and we spent a little time talking about each. I'll just quickly uh, cover them one more time. So it's inclusion of state science assessments and accountability systems. It's inclusion of career technical education indicators in accountability systems. It's inclusion of AP or IB indicators in accountability systems. And then it's STEM elements in uh, 21st century community learning centers. 
so these are the trends that we found uh, a lot of states sort of coalescing around. And it will be interesting to see um, if we can go back to the, the next batch of states uh, that just submitted their plans to see if these hold up. Our guess uh, is, that, uh, is that they probably will. Um, but uh, we will, uh, you know, we will have to uh, stay tuned on that. Um, I want to just kind of conclude by uh, talking about um, stepping back and thinking, you know, if you are in a state or in a district or uh, you're in an advocacy organization, um, how to just sort of think conceptually about using ESSA dollars to support STEM. And so when we just kind of thought about our findings and interviewed the experts, uh, we came up with uh, sort of four big things. And the first one is um, to think outside of the four walls of the classroom or the traditional school day. Um, and so ESSA funding actually can be used for out-of-school time. It can be used to pay partnerships with museums uh, or zoos or uh, other sort of science-related institutions. It can pay for professional development for partners. So, uh, you, you know, you, you uh, in a school or a district might have partners uh, that work on your after-school program, for example. If you are able to get them into STEM professional development uh, that's funded by ESSA, they are allowed to do that. So the point here is not just to think, science has to only be taught by the classroom teacher and, you know, for 45 minutes once a week. Uh, it's really thinking about all of uh, the supports and mechanisms within a school that can promote uh, STEM. The second is to be really driven by equity. Um, so thinking about where are students getting access to STEM courses, um, which students are not. Uh, and then, you know, when you look at accountability systems, some of that will be obvious. Uh, there, uh, once you're able to break down um, uh, scores in, uh, in science by school, by district, differences will appear. And so those differences should prompt questions in terms of, well, what's the science education uh, at this school versus that one? Um, and even within schools, um, it's an interesting uh, uh, question to ponder. So when we say dr be driven by our equity data, we really mean, you know, uh, especially if you are in a, a, a state with uh, large uh, sort of gaps, um, it's paying attention to those gaps and, and seeing, you know, where there are well-resourced science opportunities, uh, what can be done to uh, help schools or districts that are not as well-resourced access those same opportunities. The third is uh, seizing the low-hanging fruit, and what we mean by that is that there's a lot you can do in ESSA, under ESSA, that doesn't require any kind of you know, new law or a new policy or a new statute. Um, so one example uh, at the state level is uh, giving priority points to uh, STEM in your 21st Century Community Learning Center applications. As Jacob mentioned, uh, that's a very common thing uh, that states can do to prioritize STEM in after-school or out-of-school time proposals is to say, we will be happy to fund uh, those proposals that come to us with some sort of STEM element. Um, and so that's, that does not require, you know, anything to be changed by the State Board of Education or anything like that. It does require the State Department of Education to proactively suggest that. Um, but there's lots of other things that can be done under ESSA that uh, you know, can be done relatively quickly uh, and, and easily. And then the fourth, and this is kind of, kind of uh, uh, linking back to the very first one, uh, is thinking about outside organizations. Um, and so this you know, can manifest itself in a number of different ways. Uh, when it comes to career and technical education, it's working with industry or uh, you know, community colleges or, or higher ed institutions, trade schools. Uh, when it comes to K-12, it's thinking about museums and uh, zoos and other organizations uh, that potentially could su supplement uh, STEM opportunities. So here again, you know, it's important that uh, the, the, the effort on uh, promoting STEM in education does not have to only be uh, you know, the science department at a high school. Uh, in fact, probably shouldn't be, um, that there are a number of different partners that uh, work in STEM circles that are available to support schools and districts on their STEM efforts. So that concludes uh, our presentation. And um, before I uh, turn it back uh, to David for our q and I'll just point out a couple of quick uh, resources. First of all, the full report 
uh, uh, can be accessed on our website, which is there, and I think it's also um, in the resources part of this webinar. And then I just want to show you two things um, in the appendix that uh, you might find of interest in the full report. So um, in the report, uh, as you can see there, is sort of a state-by-state -state breakdown of the major STEM proposals and the ESSA plans we received, um, or sorry, that we reviewed. And so you can see for the 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 three first ones, um, Science and Accountability, CTE and Accountability, and Advanced Placement, or IB in Accountability, where just kind of at a glance we can tell you which states propose this in their plans as of July. For the fourth one, the STEM indicators in uh, 21st Century Community Learning Center applications, we took a slightly more nuanced view of this. So there were some states, because it was a bit of a spectrum, there were some states that um, did a uh, you know very strong priority like New Mexico did. And there are others that just didn't make it a priority, but just sort of said, you know, we'll, we'll be, this is allowable. Uh, and so we broke that down there. Uh, and then the last page is uh, just where you can find uh, the ESSA plans that we reviewed. Now, this is probably uh, almost entirely updated at this point because some states have uh, submitted uh, their, uh, their ESSA plans, uh, as I mentioned um, last week, uh, and some ESSA plans have now um, been uh, accepted. So I think you know, the, 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 the main thing to do is, um, if you're interested in finding your ESSA plans, is to look at your State Department of Education website and see which is, uh, you know, which is the most recent plan that's available. Most departments of education will have um, you know, an ESSA page where they'll, they'll post draft of plans and things like that. Uh, so I think that concludes our uh, presentation, and we're excited to answer questions. So David, I think I'll turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Anand and Jacob. Uh, I'd like to quickly remind everyone that there's still time. If you would like to submit a question, just look for the question field to the left of the slide window. Type in your question there and hit Submit. You can also download a copy of today's presentation. Just look for the Resource Center just below the question field. Okay, I have a few questions for you from the audience. First one, are there any states that have not submitted a plan at all or do not plan on submitting a plan? Uh, there are a few states that uh, I think have not submitted a plan simply because they got extra time. Um, so Texas, for example, got a little bit more uh, time to submit a plan after the September 18th deadline because of uh, the hurricane down there. Um, but generally, all states will submit a plan because they will not be able to access you know, billions of dollars in federal education money if they don't. So it will be very unlikely that any state would simply say, you know, we're going to pass up these dollars. We're not going to apply for it. Um, if a state hasn't submitted by this time, it's probably because they got a little bit of uh, extra time or uh, leeway. But generally, they'll all submit. And, uh, and I would just add there that the way this process works is that um, the Department of Education must also approve each of these plans. Um, so it's it's one thing to submit a plan, but before it can actually go into effect, and you can uh, access that um, access that federal funding, it must must be approved. So, um, you know, but we've already read a few plans that have been submitted um, that, you know, based on uh, on various things, we're not not confident they will they will be approved as as written. So, um, but yes, in in general, all 50 states plus uh, DC have to submit plans. All right. You answered a couple of the other uh, audience members' questions in that answer. So uh, let's see, 21st century uh, CLC was not included in the President's proposed federal budget. Do you expect that to change before the budget is approved and adopted? Yes. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, Jacob, were you going to jump in there? No, 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 no. Yeah, you, 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 you go ahead. Yeah. So um, one, uh, that's correct. So just as uh, I think Jacob mentioned, um, Title II, Title IV, uh, which includes 21st century, um, were zeroed out in the Trump administration's uh, budget uh, that was released, I think, in the springtime. However, uh, that uh, was uh, not quite reversed, but at least uh, it was not accepted in Congress. And so um, the, the most recent news we have out of, of Congress, I think uh, the House had included some money and the Senate – had also put money back for uh, those programs, not as much as the as 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 authorized. You know, so there's a difference between the funding levels that are authorized, which is sort of how much you can spend, versus how much Congress appropriated, which is what Congress said. Here's how much you can spend. Um, 
And so the latest news is, and this was just a week or two ago, is that uh, the Senate put the money back um, for Title II and Title IV, including 21st century community learning centers. So now, of course, you know, it was, I think it was at a slightly higher or lower level. It was a different level than what the House of Representatives had allowed. So now, uh, you know, both, both sides, both, both chambers have to get together and, um, you know, come up with uh, a compromise. Um, so we think that uh, that money will be available for uh, Title IV and community learning centers. It's, again, not going to be as much as uh, probably as, uh, as authorized and certainly, you know, maybe not as much as uh, happened under uh, previous administrations. But there will be, be some of it left. All right. And briefly related to a previous question, do we, do we know the new deadline for Texas? Uh, I, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I think I think it was just I think it was a few days, um, oh. but you know it's possible that was extended. I mean, obviously, you know, in, in a practical sense, it's going to take a significant amount of time before um, the, before the department can review all of these plans anyway. So I think they're understandably being uh, being flexible with with Texas, considering that um, submitting this plan is uh, is not and nor should it be their um, their highest priority right now. All right. I see uh, no new questions, and we are pushing up at the end of our time. So uh, we'll wrap it up here. I'd like to thank you very much, Anand Vaishnav and Jacob Waters, for this very informative session. And I'd like to thank Acer and Connection for sponsoring this webcast. I would also like to remind you in the audience again uh, that in the next day or two, two, we will be emailing you a link to an archived version of this session so you can review it or share it with a colleague. Thank you very much for attending. This concludes today's webcast. Uh, David, just um, sorry, just yes. one one quick thing. Um, just wanted so I, I believe everyone has access to uh, to our email addresses. And if you have any questions or, or thoughts or would like to discuss this further, um, we'd love to um, love to hear from you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, David. Thank you. All right. Thank you.